Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Charlton. I'm a professor of medicine and director of the Transplant Institute and Center for Liver Diseases at the University of Chicago. Thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, today we're going to be speaking about uh, implications of the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFLD epidemic on the future of liver transplantation. My disclosures. The objectives for today are firstly to talk about uh, liver transplantation considerations in the world of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and NASH and how they may be different from today. Uh, implications of NASH on rates of end-stage liver disease and hepatocellular carcinoma in the future and importance of early detection, diagnosis, and intervention. I'm going to start with uh, a case. It's a 56-year-old Hispanic woman uh, who has a long history of obesity, type 2 diabetes mellitus, and uh, aminoalanine transferase elevation. Uh, not very high. Uh, we have 1.2 to 2 times upper limit of normal. Other liver chemistries are unremarkable. Ferritin a bit elevated, 500. Uh, current medications, metformin and atorvastatin. Uh, she has some dyslipidemia and type 2 diabetes mellitus, so this is a woman with metabolic syndrome. Uh, family history, mother has diabetes, hyperthyroidism, uh, father some alcoholic liver disease. Studies for other causes of liver disease are really unremarkable other than the ferritin, which is not unusual for somebody with any kind of inflammatory liver condition. And those are her, uh, you can see her vital signs, uh, maybe borderline hypertension and high BMI, otherwise... Uh, notable just for acanthosis, nigricans, but no stigmata of uh, cirrhosis. Uh, she has mild splenomegaly, uh, and that's that's really it. So this lady is not would not be unusual with transaminase elevations. Uh, went for uh, an ultrasound, and the ultrasound uh, showed uh, some parenchymal changes that were suggestive of. Uh, probable cirrhosis, and as you can see here with the yellow arrow points, uh, she also had uh, a liver mass about uh, three centimeters in diameter. So she went for an MRI scan, a liver protocol MR. Uh, this actually just shows here uh, what an ultrasound with fatty liver would look like, where you have bright uh, signal from the liver, uh, no masses in this case. This is not her ultrasound. It just shows a echogenic uh, liver with steatosis. As you get cirrhosis, you often increase oxidation of free fatty acids, and you lose uh, the steatosis uh, feature of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this is her MR scan. Uh, and you can see uh, that in the arterial phase, she has uh, this lesion which enhances, and in the uh, delayed uh, or uh, portal venous washout phase, uh, she has washout of the lesion with uh, a pseudo capsule. So this is a LIRADS uh, 5 hepatocellular carcinoma, so highly confident of the diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma in this otherwise uh, asymptomatic uh, patient. So how how often do we see this this kind of thing? How much of a risk is this? Uh, there's so many patients out there with fatty liver disease. Is this something uh, we need to worry about uh, in all of them or some of them? And how do we uh, figure out which ones should be a concern? And what is the impact of this kind of event on liver transplantation? So this is a, a heat map of global calorie consumption per capita with the frequency, the percentages of the frequency of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So at least simple steatosis, uh, and within that will be some portion of the patients with NASH. And you can see it that the frequency of fatty liver disease varies somewhat with calorie consumption per capita. And in the United States, it's about a quarter of people have fatty liver disease. There are about a billion people worldwide with fatty liver it's widely recognized now, including by the World Health Organization, that there are more people with consequences of overnutrition than there are with undernutrition. This slide looks at the scale uh, of the problem, the uh, prevalence of uh, fatty liver disease uh, in the United States and Western Europe or the European Union. 
And if you combine the USA and uh, the European Union, it's 155 million people with at least fatty livers. That's about one in four people in those two places. The number in the United States with fatty liver is estimated to be uh, over 80 million, 80 million. The number of people with at least some steatohepatitis, so fat plus inflammation with or without fibrosis, uh, is about 28.9 million, let's say around 16 million, 16 million in the United States. The estimated number with stage 3 or 4 fibrosis, so bridging fibrosis or cirrhosis, uh, is about 5.8 million overall, uh, over 3 million uh, in the United States. So these are large numbers of patients, even though uh, most people don't end up with stage 3 and stage 4 disease, the denominator is so large, there's 83 million people in the United States and 155 million overall between the European Union and the United States. Uh, the number with advanced fibrosis is still large, just under 6 million. Total number of people with hepatitis C currently in the United States is estimated to be around 2 million. So there are more people with stage 3 or 4 disease uh, have, uh, uh, for fatty liver disease than there are hepatitis C as a whole. This slide shows the breakdown of patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the United States using uh, some prevalence data from a nice paper by Estes et al. and Hepatology published in 2017, as well as a global NASH epidemiology study and average fibrosis distributions from nine published studies. And this is where the estimate of about 83 million people, about one in four people in the United States having fatty liver disease. Uh, of those, 16.5 million people have NASH. And the uh, third column is the breakdown. So you can see that F4 is about 1.3 million, that's cirrhosis, and stage three fibrosis, about 2 million. So 3.3 million people overall thought to have F3 or F4 disease. Only 1 million people have actually been diagnosed with, hepatitis, with uh, non-alcoholic state of hepatitis in the United States. And of those, uh, about 100,000 with uh, uh, compensated cirrhosis and 70,000 with decompensated cirrhosis. The 70,000 number is interesting because we only perform uh, seven or 8,000 liver transplants in total in a year in the United States. So there are all, probably 10 patients with decompensated NASH cirrhosis uh, for every liver transplant that we perform in the U.S., so a 10 to 1 basis. This is uh, potentially an overwhelming uh, amount of end-stage liver disease. This is a natural history study. just gives you an overview of how many people progress to cirrhosis and uh, decompensated liver disease, antihepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC. So if you have 100 people with uh, at least steatosis, 80% of them Nothing ever really happens. It's a liver-related event. Uh, so 80% stable over the course of decades. But 11% will progress over 15 years or so to NASH cirrhosis uh, with a fraction of those developing HCC or hepatocellular carcinoma or decompensation. So about 80% uh, uh, never come to any liver-related harm or event. And there's about the 11% that uh, are at risk of cirrhosis and or hepatocellular carcinoma with decompensation. This is data from Leon uh, Adams, looking at the Olmsted Epidemiology Project uh, database. And what uh, Dr. Adams saw in a relatively small number of but a highly granular database study was that if you take patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and you match them by age, gender, uh, and other things to the general population in uh, Minnesota, and you follow them for eight years, Initially, the Kaplan-Meier for overall uh, survival is similar, but it starts to separate uh, out at around the uh, sixth or seventh year. There's a greater likelihood of mortality in patients with fatty liver disease. The majority is with malignancy and ischemic heart disease. Liver is the third most common uh, etiology of, or cause of death. Uh, as opposed to 11th most common in patients without fatty liver disease. So it's relatively high frequency of uh, liver-related uh, deaths, but uh, even higher frequencies of malignancy and ischemic heart disease. There are four deaths from malignancy and ischemic heart disease for everyone with liver disease. But again, with this enormous denominator of 80-plus million people, uh, it's an awful lot of liver disease. <laughs> 
So should we care about his followers of 80-something million people? What What's a reasonable strategy? Obviously, you cannot uh, even consider biopsying uh, 80 million people. Uh, it's not possible from any perspective. There aren't enough uh, people to do the biopsies. It's an overwhelming cost, or many other reasons to not consider that. And the frequency of important disease is quite low. So what are uh, uh, strategies to identify patients uh, uh, at risk for a liver-related event? And what is the, the reason to know? So we talked about end-stage liver disease, but it's interesting that uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has emerged as an important predictor of colon cancer. So this is a study of people who had a colonoscopy for average risk colon cancer screening. And some portion of them had a colon cancer on subsequent uh, colonoscopy. And I think against expectations, one of the strongest predictors of subsequent colon cancer, having had a normal colonoscopy initially, was non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is a study of uh, over 4,500 patients. So NAFLD is clearly a risk factor not just for uh, liver-related events, but for other uh, cancers, uh, stroke, ischemic heart disease, et cetera, as well. This next slide looks at the frequency of hepatocellular carcinoma as a whole and the different etiologies of liver disease leading to the hepatocellular carcinoma. The first thing to mention is that hepatocellular carcinoma is the most rapidly increasing cancer in the United States. The red sections of each bar here is the proportion of patients in each of these years with hepatocellular carcinoma that had uh, NAFLD, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as the cause of their liver disease. This goes back to 2010. It's estimated that currently it's about 50% of patients with HCC have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as the basis of their chronic liver disease. So uh, not just an increasingly important uh, source of liver disease that leads to hepatocellular carcinoma, it is the uh, most uh, frequent liver disease leading to hepatocellular carcinoma. These are data uh, that we presented uh, at EASL uh, 2017. It's subsequently uh, been published as a, a full manuscript in hepatology. And this was a study of centuzumab and solonsitib in patients with bridging fibrosis, of which there were 219, or uh, cirrhosis, of which there were 258, followed for uh, over two years on average. And this is, a, again, a very granular study because it was a clinical trial. Patients were followed very closely, very few data gaps in this study. And two things uh, emerged. So first is what's the risk of progressing from bridging fibrosis to cirrhosis? And it was about 20%, 21.5% in the two years of follow-up. And among patients who had cirrhosis, the proportion of patients who had a liver-related clinical events, so an increase in CTP uh, classification or uh, decompensation with ascites, encephalopathy, or esophageal varices, about 49 patients, which is 19% over two years. So 20% go from F3 to F4, and about 20% who have F4 or cirrhosis will progress to a complication of their liver disease. These are important data. And these are data gleaned from the scientific registry for transplant recipients with SRTR in the United States. And this slide uh, shows a, a gastro paper we published uh, a, a year or so ago. Uh, it shows firstly that hepatitis C with the green line has really fallen, about a third less transplants for hepatitis C. Uh, but NASH and cryptogenic disease uh, shown with the red uh, line here uh, steeply increasing, as is alcoholic liver disease. So alcohol is now the most common uh, indication for liver transplantation. Uh, NASH, uh, a close second. The frequency of uh, alcoholic liver disease per se, not so much the frequency of transplantation for it, but the frequency of alcohol use disorder uh, is not increasing as quickly uh, as that of fatty liver disease. So we expect sometime in the next five years or so for fatty liver disease to become and then to remain the most common cause of uh, liver disease leading to liver transplantation. This is the uh, same study by Estes uh, et al. that I showed briefly before, published in Hepatology recently, looking at the frequency of incident decompensated cirrhosis, liver cancer, and liver-related deaths among patients with fatty liver disease in the United States 
projected from 2015 to 2030. And we see as if uh, you know, here we have in 2019, um, we're you know, about a third or so of the way into this, uh, and the frequency of incident decompensated cirrhosis uh, increasing by 168% uh, in the next 11 years of the projection, 178% for incident liver-related deaths, and incident hepatocellular carcinoma, 137% uh, increase. So fairly dramatic increases uh, for each of these. Almost every other cause of death in the United States uh, is declining over time. So should we care about uh, liver histology? I think the answer is clearly yes. It's an important liver disease in fortunately a relatively small or modest subset of patients that progress to bridging fibrosis and cirrhosis. Now, why not do biopsies in everyone? I know it seems like a, an obvious uh, question with an obvious answer, but you know, firstly, it's, it's expensive. Uh, one to three thousand at least. I've seen biopsy charges of up to twelve thousand dollars per biopsy. Now, there's a misstaging. So, in about forty percent of cases, if you do another biopsy in the same person, uh, or if you do an autopsy-based study where you move the needle by uh, forty-five degrees, you'll change stage in about uh, thirty or forty percent uh, of cases. And then there's some risk. And this is uh, it's a sharp needle getting inserted into the liver. Somewhat blindly, you have ultrasound guidance uh, for ideal location, but this will not guarantee that you steer clear of things like the gallbladder, blood vessels, bile ducts, etc. So about a, a, a third of 1% risk of serious bleeding uh, and about a sixth of 1% risk uh, of death. So how frequently are liver biopsies performed? The uh, ASLD uh, considers correctly that... Uh, NASH is a histological uh, disease, so you would think that uh, there's a fairly high number of biopsies being performed given the frequency of fatty liver disease, steatosis, abnormal transaminases, et cetera. Well, there are good data presented recently uh, from the Kaiser Permanente group where they have 3 million patients in their database, and they looked at people who had an ICD code for non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease or NASH, uh, and then looked at... Uh, other people who had not had that, those ICD-9 to 10 codes. And overall, of those 3 million people, 0.1% had ever had a biopsy. If you looked at people who were diagnosed with an ICD-10 code for NAFLD, NASH, cryptogenic cirrhosis, or a very wide net, uh, less than 1% had ever had a biopsy. Uh, if you had compensated cirrhosis, about 5% had a biopsy. So even people with the most aggressive disease, only about 1 in 20 had ever had a biopsy. Decompensated cirrhosis, uh, about 1 in 25, or 3.9% you know, had had a biopsy. So very few biopsies being performed uh, for fatty liver disease. 99% of patients who are diagnosed with NAFLD and NASH have never had a liver biopsy. So how frequently are biopsies being performed? Uh, not often, and I think the frequency is probably going to decline over the course of time. Uh, with the advent of uh, wet and imaging biomarkers. Now, we've had uh, three uh, phase three studies report out this year. We've had uh, Solancetib reported out for the Stellar uh, Four study. Uh, beta colic acid uh, has reported out. I think it was called the Regenerate study. Uh, and there are many more uh, coming through uh, the pipeline. Uh, and Rikasan just reported out, not for a phase three, I believe, but it was a, a negative study. But it's likely uh, we already have one drug that met its endpoint, the beta colic acid. Uh, these drugs will probably be expensive, and it's likely that prior authorizations will be required uh, for patients to get access to these medications. So that's a poss it's possible that the number of biopsies might increase uh, in this context. Uh, this is uh, a slide of Drugs that are in the pipe is not a complete or a comprehensive slide, but this is a good number of the agents that are in phase one, phase two, phase threes, and uh, subsequent uh, uh, phases of uh, clinical trials. Uh, there are six phase three studies open uh, right now. Two have reported out in recent months, and a, and a phase two B reported recently as well. Let's look more closely at the drugs that are in phase two B and three. First thing to consider, this is a, just a picture of NASH. You can see the beautiful uh, trichrome stain here, and you can see uh, the wispy fibrosis uh, in a pericellular fashion, steatosis, uh, 
You can see some ballooning of hepatocytes. And the two endpoints that are currently considered by the Food and Drug Administration, one is at least a one-stage improvement of fibrosis without worsening or NASH, and also NASH resolution. And when you hear NASH resolution, it's easy to think that this slide would have none of these diagnostic features, but that's not true. If you lose ballooning or you have a decrease of uh, two in an NAS score or more, that can be considered uh, NASH resolution. So most studies have as their primary endpoint improvement of fibrosis by at least one stage without worsening uh, of NASH, and there is uh, one study that has NASH resolution as its uh, primary uh, endpoint in advanced clinical trials right now. If you look at the placebo response rates in clinical trials, it varies with uh, the study uh, and the endpoint. So looking at NASH resolution on the left, on the left about 9 to 21 percent of patients uh, have NASH resolution in placebo arms. Uh, about 19 to 40 percent have NAS improvement of at least two with no increase in fibrosis stage. And fibrosis stage increasing greater than one, uh, 5 to 21 percent in the recently reported studies from a beta colic acid and salonsitib, the placebo response rate was uh, 12 percent for uh, fibrosis improvement greater than or equal to one stage. And if you look at margin uh, of placebo, over placebo for NASH resolution, shown with the agents in advanced stages of clinical trial, and on the right-hand side, the pink highlighted uh, agents are the ones that are in phase three, uh, you can see the frequency or percent response of NASH uh, resolution. So really not very high for the uh, advanced agents. Um, weight loss of greater than or equal to 5% uh, has the highest reported uh, frequency of NASH resolution. And this is higher than uh, even uh, the GLP-1 agonist liraglutide, uh, higher than data seen with pioglitazone in the PIVN study, uh, et cetera. And again, these are not head-to-head -head data. These are uh, just individual reports lined up uh, next to each other, so they should not be considered a true comparison. But this is margin over placebo for fibrosis improvement greater than or equal to one stage. Uh, Salonsitib and a beta colic acid or cell and OCA on the far left-hand side of this. A beta colic acid met its endpoint. We had a margin over placebo of 11.2%. The blue dotted line is a hopeful at least 20% margin uh, over placebo. So far, none of the agents are reporting that. Uh, pioglitazone, weight loss greater than 5%, liraglutide. These are in green because these drugs are, are already uh, something you can uh, prescribe. Obviously, you don't need to prescribe weight loss, but it's something that you can uh, encourage and facilitate. Uh, pioglitazone uh, can be prescribed, but it has issues, of course, with uh, weight gain, ankle swelling, and risk of bladder cancer. Uh, liraglutide has a Food and Drug Administration label specifically for weight loss. You don't have to have type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance uh, to meet the labeled criteria for treatment with liraglutide. And, of course, vitamin E is prescribable in its current form, 400 international units twice a day. Uh, something to consider as well. There will be increasing pressure to determine fibrosis stage, or at least to risk stratify uh, patients. You obviously don't want to be giving expensive drugs uh, or to be doing uh, screening or to consider frequent visits for patients who are at little or no risk uh, of progressing to end-stage liver disease or hepatocellular carcinoma. So what factors can help us to identify patients at increased risk of more notable histologic disease uh, specifically advanced fibrosis. And there are a host of clinical uh, findings that are more prevalent in people who have advanced disease, shown on the left here, older age, metabolic syndrome, including low platelets, smoking, but not very helpful for an individual patient, uh, and certainly not helpful in terms of risk stratifying for a practical purpose. Uh, histology is important, so advanced fibrosis and fibrosis, uh, but they require some determination, of course, accurately of uh, histological stage. This is a, a study by Rohit Lumba published relatively recently in, in Gastroenterology in 2015 looking at mortality risk. And if you think about why we want to know histology, it's either for mortality risk or risk of a liver-related event like decompensated liver disease, hepatocellular carcinoma, even in the absence of mortality. Uh, the mortality risk uh, fibrosis stage predicts that very nicely here. So if you look at 
the hazard ratio for mortality, it really doesn't take off significantly compared to stage one until you get to stage four or cirrhotic stage disease. And if you look at liver-related events uh, by fibrosis stage, uh, it's a little bit more stage dependent, but the risk really begins to pick up at stage three uh, and, and stage four disease, almost a 200-fold at a high-end estimate hazard ratio for liver-related event uh, with cirrhosis compared to other stages of fibrosis. This, of course, is not surprising. Now, the thing that most practitioners or providers uh, will get as an initial idea of whether somebody has anything going on in the liver is an estimation of aminotransferases, typically ALT. Uh, and this slide looks at the usefulness of ALT. And importantly, serum ALT can be normal in up to 60% of NAFLD patients who actually have NASH. So slightly better than a coin toss. And this really should not be used uh, in any way to determine need for further study in people with fatty liver disease. Serum ALT level alone is not predictive of NASH or fibrosis level. A normal ALT cannot rule out progression to NASH. Increased ALT cannot predict NASH. So I would discourage uh, the incorporation of ALT on its own as a, a screening tool or uh, a risk stratification tool. Can genetics uh, be helpful? There's lots of tests uh, you can, the patients uh, will order on their own, like uh, 23andMe, Nat Geo has uh, a genotyping profile. There are other uh, sources out there. Mayo Clinic has recently started uh, a, a genotyping service for patients uh, as well. There are some genes that are strongly associated with histological findings of fatty liver disease. The best known is PMPLA3 or adiponeutrin. This is a slide from Stefano Romeo's New England Journal uh, uh, paper, the paper on Nature Genetics paper, uh, showing the association of PMPLA3 with uh, fat in the liver uh, in addition to elevated transaminases. This is held up really well in every uh, study that's looked at it pretty much subsequently that if you have the higher risk allele for PMPLA3 in a dose-dependent fashion, you have a higher risk for uh, histologically uh, advanced uh, NASH, uh, as well as uh, fibrosis. Importantly, uh, recently, HSD17B13 uh, uh, was shown to strongly associate with aminotransferase levels in people uh, who had uh, fatty liver disease. It's subsequently been shown to be true in other causes of liver disease as well. This was a relatively recent finding in 2018 in the New England Journal. Uh, and it's, it may be a loss of function. Uh, the the uh, protein is shortened in the uh, protective allele. Uh, so the TA, uh, TA uh, allele or, or genotype is associated with lower transaminase levels, and this is across different types of liver disease, here shown with uh, fatty liver disease. And it does vary with PMPLA3, which varies with uh, geography and ethnicity. So it's hard to separate out uh, HSD uh, from PMPLA3 as a, a risk factor. Uh, it'll be interesting to see studies going forward to determine whether it's a true loss of function versus a protective effect of the uh, uh, shortened protein and whether it, it is distinguishable in terms of physiology uh, from the risk associated with PMP, uh, LA3, and geographic or ethnic origin. This was an interesting study uh, performed at the University of California, San Diego, by uh, Rohit Lumbus Group, looking at twins who were monozygotic or dizygotic, and looking at liver stiffness, which is a reasonable measure of liver fibrosis uh, in the monozygotes on the left and dizygotic twins on the right. And even though there is a statistically significant correlation, stronger correlation in the monozygotic twins that was not seen in the dizygotic twins, uh, there still was most of the variability was attributable to something other than genes. So genes in and of themselves are really not going to be helpful, at least not yet, for developing a risk stratification uh, strategy or screening strategy for fatty liver disease. That may change over time, but with what we have today, uh, it's not possible to use genes on their own. That environment, if it's not genes, uh, could it be something in our environment? 
Well, these are uh, posters from Morgan Spurlock's Super Size Me. Uh, and a number of years ago, uh, while uh, working on an NIH grant uh, for a small animal model for Fatty Liberties, he went to see this movie. And you may not remember the premise of this, but Morgan Spurlock uh, essentially had to eat nothing but McDonald's food for a month. And if they asked or offered to supersize the meal, he had to say yes. He was withdrawn from the movie at the advice of his South African physician because his transaminases went up to several hundredfold uh, in just the two weeks. So this struck me as something which was probably Nash, uh, and we had a good environmental cause. Whatever was in uh, McDonald's menu uh, seemed to uh, do this. We went back and recreated uh, the McDonald's uh, diet in mice and gave it to them for uh, six months. Uh, this is the study published in uh, American Journal of Physiology. And this is one of the mice which are uh, really not genetically altered in any important way. It's a C57 black six mouse strain fed essentially food equivalent in content to the average uh, McDonald's diet uh, with fructose added to the drinking water. And this was uh, uh, an unusual finding. These, these mice developed uh, steatofibrosis. They had all the features of NASH, including balloon degeneration, uh, this uh, pericellular fibrosis, as well as the inflammatory changes. So environment is enough. So just having uh, a fast food type diet is enough to give you uh, NASH. The reason for that, uh, in the interest of time, won't go into depth, but cholesterol activates uh, stellate cells, and this has been a very reproducible uh, finding. I think one way to think of it is uh, fructose essentially is gasoline and uh, cholesterol as the uh, flame for the fire of fibrosing uh, NASH. So what are wet biomarkers? It's obviously if genes aren't adequate. Uh, nutritional history in and of itself is not predictive enough. Uh, so what about wet biomarkers, blood tests for fatty liver disease or severity of fatty liver disease? This slide looks at a couple a couple of papers from hepatology and another from gastroenterology, uh, looking at the NAFL fibrosis score and FIB4, as well as some other uh, wet biomarkers, the BARD score, the uh, ALT to platelet ratio index, and the NAFL score. And the interesting thing here is uh, that the FIB4 and the NAFL DFS perform pretty much as well as each other, and they seem to perform better than other uh, wet biomarkers. The NAFL DFS uh, and the FIB4 overlap for age, AST, ALT, and platelet count. Uh, and then the NAFL FS score uh, includes BMI, albumin, and impaired fasting glucose. Uh, both of these are freely available uh, as calculators online. The uh, NAFL fibrosis score uh, will uh, uh, calculate for you the score and also tell you whether it's a high-risk, intermediate, or low-risk uh, number. So it's a very user-friendly uh, uh, site. If you have a NAFL uh, FIB4, uh, sorry, fibrosis score uh, in the low risk range, uh, the negative predictive value is 92% and a similar number for uh, FIB4. So these are very useful uh, in excluding advanced uh, disease. And most patients, the great majority of patients, will have low risk values uh, for these two scores. This is a table uh, looking at biomarker performance of distinguishing fibrosis stage 0 all the way up to periportal disease or fibrosis stage 2 uh, from bridging fibrosis or cirrhosis, so F3 or F4 disease. And if you look at the negative predictive value here, uh, it's 95% for a low-risk FIB4 score and 92% for a low-risk uh, NAFLD fibrosis uh, score. So you'll be right about 19 times out of 20 in terms of being able to reassure patients that they do not have significant uh, liver disease. So this is something which I'm sure we'll be able to start to incorporate into risk stratification or screening uh, strategies for patients. Now this is a more a comprehensive look at biomarker performance F. 0 to 2 versus F3 to 4 in a prospective study of 289 patients with biopsies uh, to uh, control the study. Uh, and this also included uh, uh, vibration-controlled transient elastography, often referred to as uh, fiber scan. Uh, 
and something which is uh, approved for use in the European Union, the enhanced liver fibrosis uh, test or the ELF test. Uh, so we talked previously about FIB4 and AFLFS, and this adds in ELF and FibroScan. And this is an interesting, interesting study in that the uh, performance is actually very high for the ELF score, uh, vibration, con vibration control transit elastography or fiber scan, as well as uh, FIB4 as mentioned uh, before. So I, it, the performance of these tests, uh, either on their own or uh, separately, is, is encouraging. The ELF tests or the enhanced liver fibrosis test not currently available in the United States, but a strong data set. Uh, or large data set is in front of the Food and Drug Administration. We expect this to be decided upon uh, maybe March, and I think probably not later than April of 2019. In this study, uh, an ELF of less than 10.5 had a negative predictive value of 98%. And the ELF test is a combination of uh, TIMP1, hyaluronic acid, and procollagen 3 uh, NP, so two proteins and hyaluronic acid. And it's a nice dynamic test which can change uh, over time. The scatter plots uh, of that study and this biomarker performance. And if you look at the table at the lower part of this slide, you'll see that if you look at transient elastography uh, or uh, fiber scan of less than 15 kilopascals, 187 of people with biopsy of F0 to 2 uh, had uh, the uh, transient elastography of less than 15 uh, kilopascals who also had an ELF score of less than 10.5. So if you combine these two tests, uh, there was a tremendous performance. You were right, 187 out of 192 times if your transient elastography was less than 15. And the small number of people who had higher uh, transient elastography liver stiffnesses as measured by uh, fiber scan in this instance, uh, if, again, combining with the ELF score, you were right uh, well over 95% uh, uh, of the time. Can you predict bridging fibrosis and cirrhosis without a biopsy? I think the answer is moderately well, maybe maybe quite well. Uh, and remember, the biopsy itself is, is, is somewhat variable. It, you get about 1 50,000th uh, of the liver, uh, and there's some anatomical variation from one uh, region of the liver uh, to another. So the gold standard itself uh, is far from perfect. So yes, uh, but you could make the case that the only reason that histology is important is because it's a marker or predictor of clinical events, such as hepatic decompensation, liver cancer, uh, et cetera. So what about biomarkers separate from histology? Can they predict clinical events and decompensation? Now, this is uh, a study by Paul Angulo, which I referenced earlier, published in Gastroenterology, where he looked at the uh, NAFLD fibrosis score uh, as a predictor, not of histology, but of mortality. And what he saw was you had the low-risk NAFLD FS, so less than minus 1.455. Nothing happened in 300 months uh, of follow-up, so very long follow-up, uh, 20 years plus. Nothing happens to those patients. So clinically, even if you were wrong, if you mischaracterized patients, if they have a low NAFLD FS, nothing happens in terms of uh, survival. Those patients do very well. And it begins to change in the intermediate group, but not until you're more than, say, five or ten years out. And it's in the high-risk NAFLD FS score group that you begin to see changes in uh, survival. So NAFLD FS as a biomarker is an excellent predictor of uh, or identifier of patients at risk for uh, decreased survival. How does that compare to, say, Fibrosis, so comparing fibrosis stage 3 to fibrosis stage 4. And these are data from that Solonsitib uh, and Simtuzumab study. So, again, um, nearly 500 patients in total followed prospectively very closely for uh, over two years. And what you see, the red line are uh, patients with uh, cirrhosis. The blue line are patients with bridging uh, fibrosis. And they're really... They don't separate in terms of a Kaplan-Meier for liver-related clinical events or progression to cirrhosis. So histology itself is not a wonderful predictor of events when you compare it to, example, what Paul Angulo had shown for the NAFLD FS. And this is your data from the same study, um, uh, same study population, but with different authors looking at that enhanced liver fibrosis uh, uh, 
test or the ELF test, and, and looks at, at the ability of baseline ELF to predict subsequent uh, clinical events, and it dichotomizes really at an ELF of 11.3. Uh, so really nothing happens to patients uh, in terms of survival free from liver-related clinical events, and the same was true for uh, uh, progression of disease uh, as well. Uh, it dichotomizes as well as that, at that L score of 11.3. So do you really need a biopsy if your biomarkers, uh, these wet biomarkers, can identify patients at risk for clinical events? So this is a very interesting discussion to have. And not only does it predict uh, subsequent clinical events, it also... Uh, uh, is important in terms of it being a dynamic test. So a change uh, in ELF score, uh, a unit change in ELF score is associated with a doubling of risk in a liver-related outcome. It's one of the things I, uh, I like about this test. What about imaging? Another, another non-invasive way of assessing uh, risk of decompensation or of assessing uh, fibrosis. There are three primary uh, tests separate to uh, ultrasound. Um, and one is vibration controlled transient elastography. Uh, this is uh, it's fairly accurate. I'll read the data for you in a second. It predicts risk of decompensation and complications. Uh, and it correlates well to some degree with, with portal pressure. It's most reliable in ruling out advanced liver disease, performing that role in the same way that the wet biomarkers that we just reviewed do. Magnetic resonance elastography, or MRE, uh, is, I think, unquestionably the most accurate of the imaging modalities, but it is costly. I think it costs maybe uh, four uh, to tenfold more, depending uh, on where you are, uh, for uh, determining liver stiffness. And there's no point to care access. You can have uh, VCTE uh, or FibroScan present with you in clinic. We have it in our metabolic and fatty liver clinic, and patients have it before we go in to see them. Uh, it's uh, the Portability of the machines uh, can be a help as well for VCTE. I'm starting to see standard ultrasound equipment now get uh, additions of elastography point quantification systems so that even when he orders a routine ultrasound, I'm expecting radiologists to start to report back uh, EPQ. So this is an emerging ultrasound-based system, and it measures real-time liver stiffness during a regular ultrasound uh, scan. And this seems to be non-inferior uh, for accuracy compared to trans elastography. This has not really hit prime time yet, but uh, will be something to consider more uh, in the course of time. Got MR elastography quickly. Uh, so a drum about the size of uh, a Frisbee is placed over the liver and held by a Velcro uh, strap. Uh, it beats at 60 beats per second using an active driver. Uh, the passive driver is that uh, bladder uh, attached to the patient over the liver. And it creates force waves that change uh, or are uh, measurable in terms of their speed as they move through the liver uh, by MR. They move in and out of uh, phase by uh, 180 degrees. And you can generate maps of uh, speed as these waves move through the liver. So you change or you, you can generate an index of liver stiffness, and stiffness is what determines the speed of the waves that move through the liver. And this slide shows the liver stiffness measured by magnetic resonance elastography and its association with different stages of liver fibrosis from normal uh, through to people with chronic liver disease stages F0 through to F4. And the interesting thing in this study, which has been reproduced multiple times subsequently, is that if you have less than three kilopascals of liver stiffness on MRE, you really have nothing important going on uh, in the liver. So again, an extremely helpful or reasonably accurate tool for identifying people who don't have uh, liver disease. There's more variability once you get above three kilopascals of liver stiffness, but less than three is very reassuring. This is a study from the University of California in San Diego looking specifically in patients uh, with fatty liver disease. And there's this uh, same association as you get more liver stiffness or more uh, uh, fibrosis, um, the MRE uh, will increase in measured kilopascals. The performance of this test in terms of the area under the receiver oper operating curve, or AUC, is 0 0.92. So this performs as well as any of the uh, wet biomarkers and probably as well as repeat liver biopsies in identifying uh, stage uh, of disease. Looking now at uh, vibration controlled transient elastography uh, uh, or fiber scan, uh, there are three 
primary platforms for this, the 430 Mini, the 530 Compact. The 430 Mini is, is relatively low weight to truly uh, mobile uh, device. The 502 and the 530 are, uh, I would consider them not to be mobile, despite one of them being uh, more compact than the other. The R2-D2 looking thing uh, on the top right uh, is um, more portable than the 502, but uh, still, I think you're really limited to the 430 uh, if you're taking it between uh, clinics. The nice thing is that uh, you, you get it in real time at point of care. These are what the uh, reports uh, look like. So you get a number of things. You get uh, a median uh, uh, attenuation, which is this a CAP score, which is uh, essentially a dissipation of the high-frequency ultrasound waves as they move through the liver and they dissipate more, the more fat there is uh, in the uh, liver. Uh, and there's a number of readings, uh, which is uh, recorded for you as well. The stiffness is measured in kilopascals. And then you have, the, uh, for each reading, there's a, a visual image uh, as well. For me, the, if you have these three things, you have a patient that you can reassure in terms of not having advanced liver disease. And that's really what we use uh, uh, VCTE for, uh, vibration control transit elastography for in our clinic. Uh, is to identify patients uh, that don't seem to have important disease. And the combination of an interquartile range, which is a measure of reproducibility of less than 30%, and uh, less than 7.9 kilopascals of liver stiffness is reassuring. I don't really worry so much about the uh, CAP score, uh, but a level of less than 290 uh, is uh, somewhat reassuring as well. But the real thing is... Uh, uh, technically adequate study, which is the interquartile range of less than 30 and less than uh, 7.9 kilopascals of liver stiffness. This looks at, this looks at data from uh, the United States, Europe, and France, and Hong Kong. And the columns that are blue uh, are patients or the average VCTE or liver stiffness in patients with bridging fibrosis and cirrhosis compared to the light blue, which is F0 to 2. And that's the real group that you want to distinguish, F0 to 2 compared to bridging fibrosis and cirrhosis. And the cutoff here, so you, again, that's where that 7.9 uh, number uh, comes from. So in the United States, the number of less than 7.9 is uh, very reassuring for uh, important fibrosis stage. 9.9 and higher is the average for uh, patients with F3 and F4. So bring all of those wet biomarkers and imaging together, this is how uh, we use it in clinic. So if you have a VCTE of less than 7.9, or you have a Fib4 of less than or equal to 1.3, or should it become available, as we expect, an ELF uh, test results of less than or equal to 9.3, in a patient with a low clinical suspicion of advanced disease, you can treat that patient as low risk and reevaluate in three to five years. There's really no reason to consider biopsies in that group. And that will be the great majority of patients uh, that are sent uh, any of our way for fatty liver disease. So most people will have low biomarker and a low clinical suspicion. Let's say you have either the low VCTE, Fib4, uh, or ELF, and you have a high clinical suspicion for whatever reason. It may be that they have stigmata of liver disease, maybe a low platelet counts. Uh, you choose your reason for high clinical suspicion. Those patients should probably move forward to either MRE uh, or uh, biopsy. If you have a high uh, trans-elastography score or liver stiffness, a high Fib4 or ALF, uh, and you have a high clinical suspicion of advanced disease, those patients probably don't need a biopsy either. Those patients should be treated as uh, high risk. Uh, and it could be that you have nodular changes on ultrasound may be a reason for high clinical suspicion. It could be low platelet count, et cetera, as we discussed before. People who have discordance between their wet biomarkers, so the VCTE, uh, Fib4, or ELF, uh, but they have a low clinical suspicion, so the, the uh, biomarker studies are suggestive of more advanced disease, but you don't have much suspicion uh, clinically to say it's a younger patient without metabolic syndrome, et cetera. Those patients are another group to consider uh, for uh, MRE uh, or liver biopsy. So this grid, I think, really helps to uh, risk stratify uh, patients in the clinical setting and avoiding liver biopsies in the great majority uh, of patients. And the important thing uh, 
clinically is that you'll be correct uh, more than 95% of the time, say about 95% of the time. And what we've seen from the NAFLDFS study for clinical events uh, and from the uh, ELF results in the Salomcitib Simtuzumab study is nothing happens to patients with those low scores. So even if you're a bit wrong with histology, maybe it does have a bit more disease, clinically they're highly unlikely to come to any group. So nothing terrible happens uh, w when you get it wrong. But to be right 95% of the time I think is very reassuring. So for the last stage of this presentation uh, for features um, uh, or special considerations for liver transplantation. Firstly, metabolic syndrome is very strongly associated with uh, a diagnosis of natural cryptogenic cirrhosis before transplantation. But as for uh, patients without liver transplantation, NASH is really a marker for uh, cancers, ischemic heart disease, and also for uh, renal disease. Predictors of post-transplant uh, metabolic syndrome really uh, are variable, but the most important and consistent uh, thing is weight. So a focus on weight management uh, is an important a consideration in our approach to patients who've undergone liver transplantation for NASH. The frequency of bariatric surgery is uh, increasing quickly in the United States. In 2017, there were 230,000 such procedures. We're seeing more people who've had bariatric surgery uh, come to uh, liver transplantation, it's about 60% have had a sleeve and about 18% uh, have had a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. And it's important to consider what this may mean to transplant patients. Now, outcomes at five years uh, following uh, liver transplantation uh, are shown here. So NASH does recur, uh, but it doesn't lead to much in the way of advanced disease. So uh, at five years, only about 5% have uh, cirrhosis, and this is probably a high-end uh, estimate. Even though the frequency of NASH is a bit higher, uh, 7 to 30%, uh, the frequency of cirrhosis is about 1 in 20. This looks at uh, probability of graft failure in many thousands of patients in the scientific registry for transplant recipients. And you can see from uh, this slide that this really uh, superimposable uh, probability of graft loss uh, for people who have NASH, cryptogenic cirrhosis, or any other indication for transplantation. So even though NASH does recur at the low frequency that I just uh, demonstrated or, or showed, uh, it doesn't result in graft failure very often, and not at rates that uh, make it discernible from other etiologies of liver disease, at least in the medium term of three years. So getting back to bariatric surgery, uh, it's an important thing to consider when you're uh, using immunosuppression. Uh, so the sleeve procedure uh, shown on the top left here where you lose about 90% of the stomach content, but there's otherwise a normal uh, intestinal anatomy. So uh, the uh, substantial portion of the stomach removed during the sleeve a gastrectomy procedure compared to the Roux-Y gastric bypass shown in the bottom left here where you lose a great deal of gastric uh, content uh, or, or capacity I should say uh, and then you have a hookup of or, or, uh, the Roux-Y resulting with an alimentary limb of say 100 to 150 centimeters so you lose absorption over 100 to 150 centimeters of small uh, intestine. This is important because tacrolimus and Mammalian target of uh, rapamycin inhibitors are primarily absorbed in the duodenum. Uh, intestinal cytochrome P450 is an important component of tacrolimus and mTOR inhibitor metabolism. Uh, so in the Roux-Y gastric bypass, you will lose uh, absorption uh, of TAC and uh, mTOR inhibitors. MMF is absorbed in the stomach. It's relatively unique among immunosuppressive agents, and that is absorbed uh, substantially from the stomach. Cyclosporin uh, requires bile salts uh, for uh, absorption. Uh, the neural preparation is said to require uh, less of this, but uh, still bile salt uh, dependent on absorption. And on the Roux-Y gastric bypass procedure, you have 100 to 150 centimeters of small intestine where there are no bile salts. Uh, and the AUC is overall reduced about 40 to 50% for tacrolimus, uh, MMF and mTOR inhibitors in the Roux-Y gastric uh, bypass procedure. 
Only MMF is affected by the sleeve gastrectomy and requires no further special consideration. So we, I think it's reasonable to prefer if a patient has not had a gastric bypass, a, a bariatric surgery, uh, or is going to have ba bariatric surgery either at the time of transplantation or subsequently, to prefer the sleeve uh, approach. And the impact of immunosuppression is highly variable between patients. At the effect of immunosuppression on NASH and the metabolic syndrome. Uh, these are data from a randomized controlled multi-center multinational study looking at the impact of everolimus compared to an everolimus uh, control arm or, or free arm, uh, which is the TAC or tacrolimus control arm. So the green and the yellow columns both had everolimus as part of their immunosuppression and both had significantly less weight gain post-transplantation, 5.9 to 4.8 kilograms compared to over 8 kilograms uh, in the TAC control arm. So everolimus is uh, statistically significantly, or leads to statistically significantly less weight gain than uh, tacrolimus uh, control uh, uh, type of immunosuppression post-transplantation. This is a 716 patient study. If you bring all of that uh, together and you look at the uh, in vitro and in vivo and uh, prospective post-transplant studies for immunosuppression, corticosteroids uh, certainly can contribute to obesity, which makes them stand out in uh, immunosuppression. Uh, they also contribute to new onset diabetes in an important way, somewhat dyslipidemic and somewhat hypertensive. Tacrolimus uh, and cyclosporin do not seem to contribute importantly to obesity. mTOR inhibitors lead to substantially less weight gain than, compare, than other uh, immunosuppressive agents, specifically the, the uh, calcineurin inhibitors, cyclosporin, and tacrolimus. Uh, for new onset diabetes, both tacrolimus and cyclosporin are pro-diabetogenic overall. Uh, mTOR inhibitors are neutral in this regard. Dyslipidemia is most pronounced with cyclosporin and the mTOR inhibitors. Hypertension, uh, some effect of corticosteroids, more pronounced with tacrolimus and cyclosporin. No effect of mTOR inhibitors on blood pressure. What about monitoring for recurrence of fatty liver disease? There are no recommendations currently from ASLD uh, or EASL. Uh, graft failure is uncommon, as I said, about 5% over three years. Uh, picking about over five years, 18% uh, of people had fibrosis stage greater than or equal to two at five years post-transplant. A third of recipients with recurrence of NASH or protocol biopsy have normal biochemical profile. So much like non-transplant NASH, uh, you really cannot use uh, transaminases uh, as an important way of determining who has recurrence and who doesn't. Now, the utility of the wet biomarker panels is unclear following liver transplantation. The impact of immunosuppression on, for example, hyaluronic acid levels and P3NP or TIMP1 uh, are really not well described at this point. MRE or magnetic resonance elastography has been shown to have a high diagnostic uh, accuracy for detection of advanced fibrosis in liver transplant recipients. The uh, AROC for this was 0 0.83 and 0 0.96 for fibrosis stage three and four. So uh, getting an MRE every uh, you know, three years or so is probably uh, reasonable, and a biopsy if uh, there's an abnormal MRE or above, uh, or let's say a level above four uh, per kilopascals. The utility and performance of trans-elastography is not well established post-transplant, uh, and I would consider periodic protocol-based uh, ultrasound with MRE uh, and or liver biopsy in patients with uh, initial liver transplantation for NASH. And I would mention that uh, patients with hypopituitarism seem to have the most aggressive post-transplant course with recurrence of NASH, and patients with hypopituitarism thereby may merit uh, special consideration for monitoring. These are the data for MRE uh, in liver transplant recipients. So it's a nice uh, prospective study uh, published in Annals of uh, uh, Hepatology. And what they looked at uh, was post-transplant uh, performance and non-transplant uh, performance in terms of kilopascals for different fibrosis stages. And you'll see that in general, uh, the transplant patients for any given degree of fibrosis have more stiffness. And this is something that surgeons have said for years is that the transplanted liver is just stiff. Uh, this is obviously true here. If you look at the mean liver stiffness uh, in over 140 patients uh, with combined uh, MRE and uh, liver biopsy, 
5.91 in the transplant setting versus 4.7 in the non-transplant setting. So stiffer livers, we may have to recalibrate uh, MRE settings for or uh, cutoffs for transplant patients. So in conclusion, recurrence of NASH uh, with fibrosis does not appear to be importantly accelerated following liver transplantation. There's no clear guidance for screening and surveillance of recurrence. Patients with hypopituitarism are at high risk. Uh, dietary cholesterol should be uh, avoided. It's one of the few relatively simple things you can do uh, to uh, reduce liver injury likelihood in patients with fatty liver disease. Screening for and treating components of metabolic syndrome is obviously important, particularly when you consider there are four deaths for uh, cardiovascular disease and uh, cancer for every one there is with fatty liver disease. And the impact of immunosuppression is evolving. Having said that, the current evidence suggests that minimization of immunosuppression might be prudent, particularly of calcineurin inhibitors in patients with fatty liver disease. Medical management. Uh, there are no specifically approved therapies. Uh, vitamin E, uh, 800 units uh, per day if a patient has fibrosing NASH could be considered. Uh, metformin, glitazones, and GLP-1 agonists only if otherwise indicated. And I've highlighted the GLP-1 agonists. As there are data, this, uh, these agents are uh, safe and effective in liver transplant recipients. And the Food and Drug Administration uh, labeled indication for uh, liraglutide includes uh, high BMI. So uh, it's something which uh, we can consider for weight control uh, in patients uh, who have had a liver transplant for fatty liver disease. I should not stop statins or ACE inhibitors. Uh, consider once daily aspirin and counsel against herbal supplements. Lifestyle modification, Mediterranean diet, which is foods without labels, so whole foods and vegetables. Uh, 60 mLs of extra virgin olive oil, that's four tablespoons uh, per day, shown in a nice New England Journal study, prospectively to show to be shown to be a benefit for overall mortality and decreasing uh, cardiovascular risk. And avoiding animal fats with red meats. Exercise patients like numbers, so 4,000 to 10,000 steps per day seems to be uh, the threshold for weight loss. And coffee, if they didn't have uh, time to show today, but coffee consumption is now overwhelmingly shown to be a benefit uh, in patients with liver disease and reducing progression to cirrhosis. And three cups uh, of caffeinated drip filter coffee per day seems to be about the sweet spot for that. Now, so in summary, uh, I think management of fatty liver disease and therapy of fatty liver disease is a lot like uh, the Tour de France. There are many competitors. It's a difficult uh, path. Eventually, uh, there will uh, be a winner, but you really can't predict it easily uh, when you're partway uh, through the race. And I thank you for your attention today. I look forward to addressing questions from the audience. Thank you.